And often today, people make the very common assumption in our society when asked, well, why don't we have any more um, great revolutions like an American Revolution? Why don't we have that type of atmosphere? Why don't we produce the Abraham Lincolns or the, even you know, the Da Vinci's, the, 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 um, the Renaissance in its own right was a very important revolution. Why don't, why don't we have that? And what you have in our society is the misconception or the to, to answer with, well, you know, it's not the Renaissance period anymore. Or, you know, like, oh, the revolution, well, that, that was a product of the Enlightenment period. You know, people used to think, you know, they used to think rationally then or something. Now we don't, now we're in a different period. <laughs> so people, it's a, it's a very formulistic model that people have in their minds that the age produced the minds, produced the moments. Whereas they're not thinking about, well, what were the ideas circulating or the the points of tension that were being created by the adherence to bad ideas or the ability to recognize good ideas and, and act accordingly in those periods that caused the age to occur, that caused the greater preponderance of geniuses to flourish in certain periods than others. Right? And that's where we, really what we have to become uh, much more comfortable with in our own minds is understanding that time as such is not linear. It's not something you just hang events on. But we're living through it right now. No, no moment exists by itself, but as a product of a continuum in the past that is resulting in a certain flow towards you know, the future. So as much as people want to live in the now and just enjoy the, the moment while there's, they can't see a crisis on the streets right now and you know, there's not people burning shit it's an illusion, because we know that the reality of the insanity governing the thoughts of you know, $24 trillion of bailouts in 12 months. What the fuck, right? How much? $24 trillion going. And it's going to be increasing if, this, if the idea that money isn't the source of value doesn't get destroyed very quickly. Because the people governing the policies that are permitting this to occur and that are cutting, that are rationalizing that you have to cut costs to social programs and other things to keep that, to get that money are living by false ideas, which we know if we adhere to, the result will be anarchy. So what, what's best, to wait for that to occur to try to like live in the, moment, in the moment when things seem comfortable or to act in the future that you know is gonna happen to prevent the inevitable from occurring. Right. And with, a, with what type of ideal will we act, will we act upon? Because we could, you know, there's various ways of intervening. There's good ways of intervening on things and bad ways, as any imperialist will, will vouch for. You know, George Bush's idea of intervening to stop the inevitable in Iraq is not exactly the type of uh, model you want to have in your mind, necessarily, when you conceive of freedom or peace. You know? So the point in this uh, class I'm going to try to go through very quickly is, well, as quickly as I can, but um, is this quality of axioms that grip a society. <clears throat> because when you look to history to find out what's causing the current, or to inform your analysis of the current uh, crises, which everybody should be doing uh, anyhow, one can't help but notice that in order for certain revolutions to occur successfully, certain axioms or certain self-evident assumptions about how the universe works or what is our human role within it have to be first tackled. Without dealing with these things, you simply can't have, uh, you can't have a solution. It's impossible. Now, I, I briefly mentioned this $24 trillion bailout where people are obsessed with just saving the banks because the old banks are, are bankrupt. Uh, but you have, you have a lot in our society that are deeply embedded in our current culture that weren't there before. You know. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, these cultural assumptions have fluctuated quite a bit. Whereas in the 1950s and 60s, you actually had a, a certain sense that mankind wasn't, uh, wasn't just another beast. Huh? We weren't just a virus on the, the purity of Mother Gaia scarring her. People actually had a conception that technology and science wasn't just a thing you do, but it was a product of discoveries. And that when they were applied, they could make people's lives better. Revolutionary thought, eh? <laughs> you could like wipe out disease and bring sanitation to areas. 
Whereas today, you, you'd be hard pressed to really find this. It's really an extraordinary person in society that, that tends to have that um, intuitively in them, especially after going through a whole educational program since you're a kid, watching Al Gore's movies forced you know, repetition in your mind that you know, your species is a, is a mistake. <laughs> Essentially, that's what the conclusion is. And that there is no future, right? The, the future is actually going to types of qualities of energy like wind and solar that bring you back to a quality of energy source that we had in the medieval ages where you have to, sus I mean, the idea of the future is the past. That's what it's been converted to and since we've destroyed the Apollo space missions and these other things. So you, 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 know, you, you investigate these things <coughs> in our culture to sort of, which, which are necessary in order to understand the political or economic insanities, which everybody should have a problem with. So I think while we're all while we're all here. Um, <coughs> and the, the best way to inform your, your actions, again, like I said, is when you go, go to history and you see how, how did great, um, the great souls deal with this problem again and again. And you'd go, of course, not to just any point in history, but you'd go to those singularities to figure out, well, who were the main figures, the main leaders of those periods that were shaping, inspiring, or, or it, the inverse, the people to act according to uh, either reason or fear, you know, just random shit. So I thought it would be fun in this class uh, would be to begin, because what I'm going to be doing, obviously, what Pascal uh, pointed out a few times is that I would be looking at the, a certain juxtaposition of the mess of the French Revolution in 1789 that went on for another five, six years. and. In doing so, I don't think it would be very competent to just look at it by itself. But you'd have to look at it, and the only way to understand it is as, because I mean, people tend not to see that revolution as a, a great role model for today's uh, society. And if you do, there's something wrong with you. Because the thing was a giant bloodbath. Um, but you would want to see why it resulted in such a bloodbath when so many of the participants and founders organizing it were such so necessary for the success of the American Revolution simply a decade and a bit prior. Because the, these ideas that resulted in the American Revolution that governed it and that took a, a certain feudal type of population under the serfdom of a British oligarchy in America, farmers, to rise above their limitations to, to fight for a principle and that resulted in the establishment of a form of government whom today represents the only solution for mankind. We know that didn't happen in France, but yet, why not, right? It seemed like the dynamic was going that way. So you gotta understand the French Revolution as a response by what we're getting at here is the British, which is totally overlooked today. People have a big problem with it. They block on the British a lot even though that we're still a dominion of the British Empire here in Canada under a governor general. If anybody didn't know that, you could check that out. Uh, <laughs> but the British wanted to ensure that there was never going to be again another American re revolution with those principled ideas that occurred in any other nation. Now that didn't occur because we know that this, these ideas were unstoppable, still are though the British tried. <laughs> and now, um, what I was going to do is, by looking at the comparison of what makes, because the question arises in my mind, right, like what makes a successful revolution to a, 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 a fucked up revolution, one that just didn't go? Well, how do you know, are, are, we know time, all moments in time aren't created equal, some are more important than others, some are more successful, but all revolutions aren't equal either. So what separates a good from a bad? And for that, again, you'd look at time because you'd see, well, what was the form of society which, came, which existed before the revolution? There's the revolution, you know, this moment of change, and then something after. So you have a before and you have an after. Now, because we have the, the ability of the human mind to compare, you know, change, we, one would ask oneself, well, was, were things better after the revolution relative to before? And if, I think we can firmly find certain standards that allow us to answer that question, then 
I think we'll, we'll, we'll pretty much know what to do again today in terms of what types of thoughts need to be protected and which need to be attacked. Okay, so the American Revolution first, because first we have to get a certain sense of what are these axioms that were holding the population back that prevented them from acting. And to do so, I figured I would look at, uh, briefly, at some of, the, uh, some of the organizing that was fought for by a gentleman named Thomas Paine, who I'm sure some of you guys have heard about, who aren't members. Thomas Paine. Thomas Paine, yeah. Ever hear of him? Paine with Paine. Paine with an E at the end of it. Now, Paine, <coughs> he was a man invited to America by Benjamin Franklin in 1776. And he quickly got on the board writing a, probably the most widely circulated pamphlet uh, ever at that point. It was called Common Sense. Right? It's one of the, one of the, if, if the greatest ideas are generally communicated with the quickest means, then you can imagine that this embodied some of the greatest ideas of mankind, because it was only about 38 pages. But this, which circulated about 200,000 copies, most were read many, many times, had some of the most principled concepts that tackled what Paine wanted to get at were three main op uh, obstacles, which was, I mean, every farmer knows at that point that your father, your grandfather, and your kids will always be under a system of a British constitution with a British empire that will do all sorts of things um, to tax you and to take your food and to, you know, uh, come in with your soldiers to rape your women once in a while. And you just, it just happens, you know, that's part of life. Um, there's certain things about that that you can't stop because the British constitution is simply a representation of the divine right of kings. God, at some point in time, you don't know when, I mean, but he bestowed uh, kings upon the earth with special rights, and uh, that's that's why you got a government is to, to protect that, right? <laughs> and then keep in mind, it's not just the king, but also, and this is the kicker. This is the this is the real crux that that's good to to really focus on because most Canadians still haven't gotten over this one. But the king's kids and grandkids and great grandkids, at some point in time, were given the right by God to rule your kids or your great-great-granddaddy's kids and yourself. So your progeny and your posterity is just thus chained to the rule of, an, you know, the arbitrary authority of a king. And that's the way things work. So Paine saw that that's not going to happen. I mean, any society that really holds on to that is not going to have a revolution. It's just, no. So to get at the, the result, which I figured I would read quickly, uh, I was going to read quickly at the beginning of the Declaration of Independence, the first couple of lines, really, just to get a certain flavor of what was created. And then we're going to look at a couple of the arguments that Paine put forth before we jump into France. All right. um, oh. Okay. Oops. Uh. Lecture, right? Yeah. Good. Okay, uh, Pat, you want to read into the mic? Yep. Uh, Come. Yeah. Uh, Pick a mic anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we to we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that that they are endowed by the Creator with mm -hmm. certain un unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of, of the governed. Mm -hmm. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute the new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall see most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's turn back on again. So that wasn't self-evident uh, for most people, but at the conclusion of at least the first war of independence, that was the result. A form of government where that became the, the mandate of, of that society, of that government. And any law that went against or infringed upon those 
rights became the metric for your society to look upon and organize themselves accordingly to even create a new government with that maintains those principles in a more perfect way. So that's a pretty set, um, that's a pretty good bit of instruction there, when you, especially when you relate it to, let's say, the Canadian Constitution, when our preamble from 1867, granted, it was updated in, in the 19, early 80s, but this still, this, this, our, our Constitution still stands. It says that the purpose of our existence as a nation is to uphold the interests of the sovereign. Right? So yeah, we got a queen, that's our constitution, that's our, you know, that's the general gist of it. Um, <clears throat> something else I wanted to say, but I forgot. Fuck. Okay. So, Thomas Paine had to take these, <clears throat> these assumptions of people born in a British dominion and mock the hell out of them. And of course the pamphlet, which you guys can get online, he does a pretty good job of it. But, right. but first what he starts doing, by hitting it first the, and it, the pamphlet is organized in a very scientific way, where there are no real assumptions. He's, he's looking at everything from, uh, from like any, any important uh, concepts like government, he thoroughly doesn't just assume you have an understanding of, but he'll go back uh, and say, well, what are these things, governments that we have, right? And he investigates, so well, how do we best understand them? Because the first two points he's addressing are the divine right of kings and the British Constitution, the British setup. What is that? Um, first, he, he, he says that, well, most people tend to really love the British government or the British setup because you have what's called a perfect balance of powers. You have a, a king. With that, that has veto right or sort of veto rights on any other um, policies that are put forth. You've got a commons for the common folk, the commoners, that's the house or the parliament, that can veto the king. Then you've got the house of lords for the aristocracy. And one of them is voted, right, which is the house of commons, that's what we do every once in a while. Then you've got the house of lords, which you're just born into or you're appointed by the queen or whichever monarch is sitting. Then you've got the monarch, and you're born there because you're in the right bloodline. Everyone can veto each other and everyone can check each other. So that's being heralded today as being the best thing because it's sort of being seen as being, well, you know, everyone's, it's, it's the best way to main, maintain stability and security because nothing can change if everybody's interests are so. Which house, house of commons, house of what? Lords. Lords, yeah. Yeah, and, and the king. What, yeah. The king. So, so of course, um, Payne says no. Um, that's ridiculous, because it's full of contradictions. There's paradoxes that arise. The main one is that if you know, if you really did want to hold true to the fact that the king was there by divine authority of God, then why would he need to be checked first of all, right? And why would he be given the veto right on the commons unless it was assumed that he was also more wise than the commons? But why would the commons be given a veto right on him on his decisions if it's not assumed that the commons are more wise than the king. Right. Point out, like these are these are crazy paradoxes. Like, why would you allow a government that has all these contradictions to it? He says, "Well, what is a government anyhow?" He says, "Well, mankind comes together out of an, out of out of a need to supply his needs and his wants. Somebody who and he starts building up the principles of of a, of a physical economy in a certain sense. He says, you know, you've got like five families and they come together. Figure before there was money in you know tribal times." And their union, their, their working together, made their lives infinitely more efficient than any one of them working individually. So they could share, there's a certain division of labor, not everyone had to cook and clean and make their own clothes and all this stuff for themselves. But so you had this, this, this new um, improvement of the quality of life, the wants and the needs of the society. He says, well, let's say this, the first governance probably would have occurred, and he speculates, you know, but under, under a tree of some sort where people would have uh, had to have convened. Everyone would have been a member of this first parliament under a tree. Yeah, like your al la pal <laughs> uh, concept. And everyone would have had an equal say. <clears throat> so the idea right there that there was already a, 
an arbitrary authority of, a, of, of God's will to, to pick a king is not really, doesn't make that much sense. Right? It was likely, though, that at some point when the tribe got bigger, families multiplied, that not everyone could participate all the time, especially when people had to travel longer distances, so you had to appoint certain representatives of areas, families. And sure enough, uh, that's probably how it would have unfolded in all, in all likelihood. The, uh, the form of setup of what we have thus is, is just completely rational on, on a variety of reasons. Now, he has the first, I mean, the first question. I've picked a certain few that just kind of embody the arguments he's making, but you guys should all read it uh, when you get the chance. The first point he, dr he addresses is, how came the king to a power which the people are afraid to trust and always obliged to check? Such a power could not be the gift of a wise people. Neither can any power which needs checking be from God. Yet the provision which the Constitution makes supposes such a power to exist, as does the Canadian Constitution. Of the divine right. <coughs> there is another and greater distinction for which truly, no truly natural or religious reason can be assigned, and that is the distinction of men into kings and subjects. Male and female are the <laughs> distinctions of heaven. But how a race of men came into the world so exalted above the rest and distinguished like some new species is worth inquiring into. And whether they are the means of happiness or of misery to mankind. Yeah. These are <laughs> Keep in mind, farmers all across the board are reading this thing in the 13 colonies at this point and are getting pretty riled up. <laughs> um, Petrus, you want to read this one? Yeah. Uh, hereditary secession. One of the strongest proofs of the folly of hereditary right in kings is that nature disapproves it. Otherwise, she would not so frequently turn it into ridicule by giving mankind an ass for a lion. <laughs> Secondly, the giver of these honors could have no power to give away the right to, of posterity. And, through, and though they might say, we choose you for our head, they could not, without manifest injustice to their children, without manifest injustice to their children, say that our children and your children's children shall reign over ours forever. Because such an unwise, unjust, unnatural compact might perhaps in the next succession put them under the government of a rogue or a fool. Right. <coughs> so it sounds like he's saying it's, it's too arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's no point, there's no basis in reason. It's just you get the rule because your dad was this guy. Right. You could be an idiot. Yeah. And he points out too where he says if it was true that the argument that this, that having this system maintains the greatest st stability, if that was true, that would be a pretty lofty argument. But, and then he points out that there's been about 19 civil wars and like th 13 revolutions in, in, in England in the past couple hundred years. And that includes the so-called glorious revolution, which if you get any uh, British written history book, it's gonna always refer to the 1688 period of the glorious revolution. Which was a total bloodbath, and was that Cromwell? No, uh, yeah, right, exactly. And that was when uh, William of Orange came in. And here you got an, an English president, uh, king, who speaks, who never spoke a word of English. <laughs> right? Was that God's will? <laughs> it, it, here's a guy who just came in from, I think it was France or something, possibly France, yeah. Netherlands? Netherlands, Netherlands. Army of henchmen, placed there by the British. Installed, <laughs> killed a bunch of people. The parliament just picked whichever side was the strongest, so they just went along with it. And uh, and Payne points out that hey, under this reasoning, uh, France should be the or the Netherlands should be the ruler of England, just like today, you know, England is somehow the ruler of America, which is on the other side of the world. Like, 
not very rational. So this was the debate that was going on all across France as well, <coughs> across the board. And you could not have had a constitution or anything of that sort if this wasn't uh, tackled. I figured I would include the writing of a guy who was a representative of the monarchist faction, the, the, the British Empire at that time, Sir Ed Edmund Burke, quickly, on his Reflections on the French Revolution, which was written around the second year of the French Revolution, as it proceeded, to give a certain sense of an opposing view to Thomas Paine, to get a certain sense of the rationality behind these guys. Now, Edmund Burke was writing specifically to attack the principled leaders around Marquis de Lafayette, um, a man who we're going to look a lot at today, whose name is Jean Sylvain Bailly, who was effectively the, the Benjamin Franklin of the French Revolution. And he was attacking their concepts that uh, Thomas Paine shared. <coughs> Uh, somebody else want to want to read this one? This is Sir Edmund Book Reflections on the Revolution Revolution in France in 1790. Yeah. Oh. You will observe that from Magna Charta to the Declaration of Rights, there has been the uni uniform the uniform policy of our Constitution to claim and assert our liberties as entailed inheritance derived to us from our forefathers and to be transmitted to our posterity as an estate especially belonging to the people of his kingdom without any reference, whatever, <coughs> to any other more general or prior right. By this means, our Constitution preserves a unity in so great a diversity of its parts. We have an inheritable crown, an inheritable peerage, and the House of Commons and people inheriting privileges, franchises, and liberties from a long line of ancestors. So, do you guys see what's, what the problem is with his uh, assessment? No? Where do, where do your rights derive as a, um, uh, as a people, from his mind? From the king. Yeah. So he, he's justifying here the idea of hereditary secession by playing kind of dirty. You know, here we have these two things, 1200 and 1300 you know, AD, the Magna Charta and the Declaration of Right, two documents that gave people new rights um, from the king. And just like you inherited those, we have an inheritable crown, an inheritable peerage, and a House of Commons and a people inheriting privileges, franchises, and liberties from a long line of an ancestors. <laughs> so all of the rights that you have, they, they're not necessarily self-evident. They're not, they weren't already there. They're only there because you inherited them from your, your serfdom father and grandfather and whoever was alive when the Magna Charta was written. But that's it. <laughs> and so thus, you'd be very hypocritical to try to criticize a king because he's just inheriting certain privileges just like you, you know? <laughs> so, right. <coughs> so, them, like, hmm? uh, your rights are based on your genes. Yeah. Political rights. Yeah. Yeah, it's like social Darwinism before Darwin is around. <laughs> <coughs> This is going to play very importantly into the conceptions governing uh, the different potential directions that the revolution could have taken and did take. Now, <coughs> Paine had a conception that the legitimacy of the government is derived from the will or the consent of the governed. The common aristocratic view was that that's not so. There is arbitrary authority and absolute power that exists in this universe. And if you're not born into the right family, tough, tough nuggies. The three par um, ideologies that manifested in different parties in, the Fra in France that period 
were primarily divided along the Jacobin parties, or just the, um, the general anarchy parties, where if you asked any one of them, what do you plan on intending on instituting if you get your bloody revolution and ki you know, kill the, the aristocracy, they wouldn't have had much of an answer, much like your modern day Marxist. You know, it's like, what do you do when the proletariat take over? Oh. <laughs> we need revolution though, oh, okay. <laughs> so you had, on one hand, right, the anarchy faction, you had the, the British party who were trying to institute a British style parliamentary system into France as an alternative. So we need a revolution, but just so we can get one of these things. And then you had... Wait, wait, the British were trying to institute some kind of system in France as the French Revolution? Yeah, they were trying to do it in America too. That's why Paine had to really attack the British Constitution so heavily because you don't want to fight a revolution with your with your with this tyrant just to adopt the tyrant's form of thinking and government, which is what a lot of the people were being duped into into supporting even in America. So the fight was, you know, is it gonna be what's the new form of system gonna look like? Because a republic never existed. Mm -hmm. Right. Elect so same thing here. And you had people and we're gonna look at most of these because the period that we're gonna look at will address primarily um, the two years of of seventeen eighty nine to ninety where some of the more uh, important decisions were made for the good and bad in France. And that party, the, the monarchist faction, is going to play a, a very important role as players on this, in this little drama here. Um. <coughs> so what did you have? The first thing to understand is that you had a famine. When, uh, yeah. yeah. So you said there were three, three parties? Oh, the other party, yes, yeah, sorry, I was cut off. It was the, uh, <laughs> thanks. You had the Republican fa faction of Marquis de Lafayette and, and Bailly. So the people who were, were instrumental in making the revolution a success in America, they formed their, uh, their own, that was one idea um, thrust, which was, for a large part of the, the beginning at least, it was w the strongest, the most influential, and the most true. Well, it still is. So the monarchist faction was identified as being run and governed by two British dukes. On the one hand, you had Philippe Egalité, who's otherwise known as the Duke of Orléans, <laughs> and the other guy was Jacques Necker, the finance minister of France. Now, we're going to investigate their role in undermining uh, for their own various intentions and reasons, the work by Marquis de Lafayette and Jean Sebebey. The works I'm going to be using in the course of my, this case study are going to primarily be derived from uh, a report or a series of reports that were written by a member in the States called, named uh, Pierre Baudry, whom I encourage you all to, to read these reports as well, which I can email to y'all. Um, the books, the, the source books that we're going to be quoting from are going to be from uh, Memoirs de Bailly, uh, of Jean Sauvé Bailly. Um, and two, so it, it's only going to be players. There's not going to be co comments on comments, commentaries or anything. We're going to look straight at the people who are either passive or active players on the stage. You had CFL, uh, I think Carl Friedrich Montjoie, who's a historian and an author who had written Histoire de la Conjuration de Louis-Philippe de Joseph d'Orléans, surnommé Égalité, uh, written in 1776, um, who had many insights and was on the ground watching uh, firsthand this whole thing go down. And a uh, ambassador from Venice to France, which was recently published, uh, named... Um, Name's not coming to me right now, but it'll, it'll come up. Antonio something. Gandhi? No. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm going to try not to uh, be too uh, quote, quotey in the course of this, this presentation, but <coughs> some things you just can't avoid. To enrich the narrative as much as possible, we are going to rely, hopefully on not too many quotes. 
to, to carry us through uh, the little flight through history here. So, okay, what made these guys such bastards? Well, we begin this drama, you could say, as a famine has already hit France for several, uh, for a couple of years. There's been the biggest hailstorms, the beginning, or the most intense period of what we now know today as being the Little Ice Age, a 40, 50 year period of cooling where there, there really was no, there was no summers to speak of, of any, of any sort in Europe, in mid Canada, or, or in the world. And so the crops were devastated, people were starving, and instead of, instead of using the granaries, because it, be, it had been already a com common custom at that point to store your food in case of ha you'd have natural disasters. So instead of uh, using those granaries as they should, what you had from 1783 to 1788 was a series of negotiations by Egalité, his... Um, Chancellor, Le Marquis of Ducrest, who I didn't have a painting of, and Jacques Necker, the finance minister, to organize the most radical series of free trade negotiations with Britain, which emptied out the entire harvests of France, of all of its grains, but based on the new uh, radical agreements, made the holding of granaries, like food food held over in case of, 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 a, of a, you know, natural disaster, it made that illegal. So everything became open to the free markets because then it was considered uh, government interference upon the freedom of the markets. Okay. Sound familiar? <laughs> so all the granaries had to be exploited. Um, Britain bought up the sum total of most of it. And at this period, you had a scheme set up where Philippe Galité, using his own massive fortune, he was the cousin of the king, got a whole series of investors to make loans to purchase up all of the grain, offering 40 to 60 to 75 percent interest, such that you could just make sure that there was going to be no food available anyhow, and you could monopolize it all. So I mean, that's a huge interest. But he, he was willing to give them 75% interest on their loans to buy up this grain because he knew, knowing that the famine was hitting and getting worse, that he would be able to quadruple the, the you know, make a fortune selling it at the highest price you know, anything, anyone could demand. So this now created a situation of near revolt. Oh, by the way, anybody, anybody who wants to participate in this, in this scheme, this loan scheme, that asked any questions, that wants to know where their money was going at that point, it's interesting to know we're not allowed to participate. So, <laughs> so you can make money, but just don't ask questions. You need to build it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They need you to build. <laughs> yeah. So at this point, people were ready to riot. I mean, you had a real tension that was created, much like you see in the United States today, where people are losing everything and getting food, finding, uh, thinking about a way to feed your family is getting harder by the moment. Um, you had Montjoie write in his book, describing the situation, uh, how this was all being manipulated. <clears throat> and he points out, he, in describing Philippe Galité, imagined that he could take over the entire nation of France by gaining hegemonic control over the food of the entire nation, by producing a general famine, by organizing so well his intrigues for that purpose that he would be able to persuade the people that the government was a s solely responsible for such a terrible calamity. He found also, in the scheme of starvation, the evil opportunity to push the inhabit ab inhabitants of the cities and the countryside into despair and then to lead them from despair to insurrection. Furthermore, if he could gain total power after the destabilizations brought about by the famine, he would be assured to m maintain himself in their usurpation by means of reestablishing abundance. So, right there. You have 
basically what he's manipulating are certain um, levers in a scared population, which is that people will generally, if they're starving, blame the people who are ruling them as being incompetent to rule them. Right. Are, are these the monarchists? Yeah. Yeah. So the monarchists actually led to the French Revolution. He once. Some got pulled in. But the leadership, which is this guy, who had his own nefarious designs, because he did have an intention, which I'm going to get into. Um, but yeah, the idea, I mean, if you, whoever disposes of the king cult by overthrowing the, the system that caused the, the pain and gives them food will be loved. Simple formula. Every fascist knows about this formula. <laughs> From you know, Hitler to Mussolini to, to anybody. Obama. Obama. And the Bush. Sure, yeah, yeah. Anybody wants to, <laughs> yeah, you want to get into power and you want to, you're a fascist, you're going to use that formula. <laughs> yeah? Good. Again, these would have been not in power, he's just the king's cousin, so yep. he's trying to get power now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. He's, thir he's third in line, fourth in line, behind the queen, Marie Antoinette, okay. the Dauphin, who I don't understand what that is, and, uh, <laughs> and then him. No. He has his um, chancellor, who is in determining these financial policies, the Marquis of Ducrest. He was the one that was sent over to England to negotiate the free trade agreements. Uh, but he's just rich as all hell. <laughs> and, but the, the finance minister of Nick, is Nickel, who you might be thinking about. Now, this is the king, this is the queen. They're not going to be in our, our little drama for much longer. <laughs> But the king was, was despaired at, cer at a certain point and begged Britain, just to give you a certain sense of the coldness of Britain and their role in this whole thing, he was begging them to sell his people 20,000 bags of wheat because they had so much of it. Like, they were overflowing more, for their own, more than their own people could handle. And after two weeks of going to, to deliberations, saying, you know, from one council to another to the privy council, finally it was decided, no, sorry. Rules the markets, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> deal, deal with it on your own. So the king was despaired. CF Munchoy report, reports that not only was this help rejected, but the refusal was so harsh that a strict rule was further passed against any contraband or any, fur, any fraud that might elude the, this edict. Thus the British, stuffed with our grains, mercilessly refused this poor Louis XVI a slight portion of sustenance that they had stolen from his own people. This rejection simply added to an already ravaging famine, and it was from that situation that the insurrection of July 14th emerged, and the heinous crimes of October 5th and 6th. Sorry, Mike. Yes. Who was this Montjoie guy? Montjoie, he was a historian. I think he was a professor in France at that point, uh, on the ground. So the yep. French Revolution was actually orchestrated by the British. Yep, that wasn't just rhetoric to get you into the class. <laughs> oh, that's pretty hard. Oh. And, and the yeah. French Revolution uh, concerned the, the yeah, Bonaparte guy, the Alexander Bonaparte guy? That came after, yeah. Uh, that was after. Well, that was a necessary result. Yeah. <clears throat> so, at this point, At this point, enter Bailly and Lafayette. <clears throat> and what they had done behind the back of Necker, keep in mind, Necker and Egalité are very, very tight in this whole thing. Their conception, like I said, starve the population, overthrow the, overthrow the king, supply grain, become king. That's the, that's the plan. Necker also, in facilitating this process, created or convinced the king who was he managed to sneak his way in as a close confidant to create what were called les trois les, les trois estat, estate the three estates yeah the estate general oh I'm reading from, from both oh okay yeah well maybe he manipulated them to behave a certain to take on a certain form 
uh, that could be one thing. But he wants to utilize the st estate general to convert to become converted into um, the, s the the layout for the British system. And the way this estate general works or works at that point was that you had well, there were three, right? You had uh, one was for the aristocracy. Right? They got twenty one fourth of the vote. Then you had for the clergy, the Pope, they got one fourth of the vote. This is the general layout of the government. The king still had an it was still an absolute monarchy, monarchy of a certain sort, but this played a very important role. Then you had the the third estate, which was generally uh, the people. It had its problems, but it was generally the people, and that got a half. So. Unlike the type of balance of power structure you had in Britain, with the House of Commons, House of Lords, and the King all maintaining sort of equal shares, yeah, you didn't have that here. So the organizing, this was taken advantage of by Bailly specifically, who was able to utilize the one half power and organize uh, those within the aristocracy and clergy who had half a soul and a mind to, to think to support the conversion of this system of uh, the estate general into what we now know as the national, or not now, because it just, but what became the National Assembly. What's the Assemblée third, Nationale. Third, third, uh, you, you forgot the word. Third, it's the people. people. People, yeah, the people. Okay. And, I mean, you had to, I think, be a, a property owner or something, which excluded a big portion, it's like two thirds of the people were excluded in a certain sense. Uh, yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah, you're not born there. You're just, yeah. Okay. So you had now the formation. This was disbanded in favor of the National Assembly. The National Assembly <coughs> was convened very, very quickly in this time of crisis to deal with these, with these problems of the bankruptcy of the nation, the famine, the, the necessity for instituting a Republican-style form of government very quickly while the mass effect was, was in full, uh, full swing. So you, you can't wait too long with these things, right? If the, if the population are acting now, now's the time where you have to be the leadership for them. So Bailly understood this, and the people around him did too. Um, this is a picture of Martin Lafayette, um, Bailly, right here. Bailly, well, not yet. So, sorry. Now, their idea was to institute the principle to get rid of. The, keep in mind what Thomas Paine was going for: get rid, you have to get rid of the hereditary principle. You have to destroy the British Constitution. You need a system where the will of the consent of the governed is the legitimacy of the government. Their institution, well, we should just read the Tenth Court Oath, because, yeah, we should read the Tenth Court Oath. This convened on June 20th, 1789. It's one of the most under, misunderstood or unknown parts of the French Revolution, where the National Assembly, under the leadership of Bailly, was intended to create a constitution for the nation, which is the defining moment that would determine how the unfolding of the legislation, the general predisposition of the government would behave. It's the constitution. He understood that very importantly. So you can't really have a, a nation if you don't have a solid one. And he attempted to, to set one up in the usual place of business. I forget the name of the parliament type area, but it was shut down. And the king at this point was being manipulated to, or he was becoming very, very paranoid of the Assemblée Nationale, uh, the National Assembly, and he was being in, induced to take measures that were completely against the interests of France. The first one was locking down this Parliament area where they were planning on instituting an oath that would force all of the members of the Assemblée to remain together as they had in the U.S. In the, in, the, in the 1787 Constitution, Constitutional Convention, <coughs> until a, a firm principled constitution would be cracked out. And that was the arrangement. 
the way Benjamin Franklin was doing it two years earlier. So when nobody was, nobody could get in, because apparently the story was, you know, the king was going to be giving a speech there in three days, so they had to prepare the, uh, the assembly or the, the parliament. But he said, okay, fuck it, let's, let's go to the tennis court. And so they went down to this sort of recreational area and had it there. And the oath uh, effectively solidified the powers of the National Assembly as a republican institution within uh, the monarchical system of, of France. So, you want to read it, Pascal? Yeah, can you just read it? Oh, shit, yeah, sorry. Black on black, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> The right. tennis court of June 20th, 1789. The National Assembly, considering its role in establishing the constitution of the kingdom and working toward the regeneration of public order in maintaining the true principles of the monarchy and assuring that nothing can prevent it from pursuing its deliberations in whatever place it may be forced to con constitute itself, and that wherever its members may be assembled, there stands the National Assembly. This assembly declares that all of the members shall, in a moment solemnly, swear to never depart and to assemble itself anywhere that circumstances will permit until the constitution of the kingdom is established and consolidated on solid ground. And the said oath being sworn, all of the members and each in particular shall confirm this unshakable resolution with their signature. Mm -hmm. See any contradictions in there from what we've been talking about so far? Wait, just a second. Is yeah. he saying like, okay, nobody's leaving until we do this? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. no. Well, he's saying that you, we have to be together on this. We have to commit to make this oath that we will remain in collaboration until we crack out a constitution. It won't happen that day. Okay. But like until that no further business. Keep, keep yeah, keep keep on track. They do other I mean, yeah. They, that that's the priority. Um but other than that, do you see any contradictions in sort of the um the mission statement so far of the uh the Assemblée? Well there's a kingdom. Yeah. Kingdom? You mean the you mean the monarchy? Tradition? Yeah, right. Sort of, sort of paradoxical, right? Like true principles of the monarchy. <laughs> Divine right of kings. Hello, is that a principle? Um, this is what what Pierre Baudry uh, calls the French paradox, <coughs> where you have a system set up that. You could have a bloodless revolution. You could have the greatest good occur in the quickest time by setting up in what Bailly had in mind was a king for and of the people. Right. So you get a republic system with the allowance of a monarchy. So you allow for a, mar a monarch to exist. Which seems, again, it's kind of like, what the hell? Aren't they just born there? But so, in his mind, because he knew also the king was generally a good, he wasn't a tyrannical king. He was played a lot, a little soft-minded, but he was, he had a true sympathy for the American Revolution. He was, you know, by testifies to the fact that he was a good man. And anything he did, he at least did because he thought it was for the welfare of the French people. So in this situation, maybe if it was a different king, he wouldn't have done so. But in this situation, he wanted to create a structure where the the king would sort of be serve as a president, mm -hmm. and the will of the people would legitimize the king being there. And this is what he tried to convince the king uh, profusely as a means of avoiding what he s foresaw as being a bloodbath if the king goes in the opposite direction. And at that point, uh, during the famine, you had already had certain crackdowns on the population who were getting riley. So if the king kept in that direction, he knew that it was going to go to hell. He describes here, <coughs> right, this is, this is in his memoirs, describing this, these, the uh, assertion of the power of the Assemblée, where he writes, 
This assembly, an infinitely small portion of the nation, felt nonetheless the force and the rights of the whole. It did not dissimulate the fact that it was acquiring for itself a sort of authority as a result of these rights and of this force, as can be attained by particular wills intended to compose the general will. The Assemblée was in, a, was in a hurry to establish itself. We were told that the government was not happy with the firmness that the commons displayed, and the fear was that it could go beyond what the Estate General had been accustomed to do up until that time. Backed up with a legal representation of at least the majority of the com communes of the kingdom, such an assembly had become formidable because it was capable of ex executing and any def defensive actions since it had power to give orders and was virtually assured of being obeyed. So you had the necessary power to form uh, a government. You did not yet have the will of the king. The will of the people were there, but not the king. Well, sorry, man. Yes. According to that, it sounds like they have like a check on the king a little bit, on the king's power. Yeah, in a certain sense. Because they're, they have even more rights than the Etat General. Yeah. Well, the, it definitely knocks the king's absolute power uh, down quite a bit. So and that's why the king was getting kind of threatened by it, oh, too. Because yeah. he was being, he had little, little people whispering in his ear, little Iagos, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whispering little sweet nothings about how Bayi wanted to overthrow him or something, you know? So, so Bayi was kind of proposing a, a sort of constitutional monarchy uh, in response to um, the upheaval. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like it's sort of trying to be compromising. Yeah, in a certain sense, but on principle. Yeah. But well, I follow up, uh, Matt. Mm. You said people were, were trying to uh, put like intrigues in the king's mind, and maybe that's why he was a little bit uh, mm -hmm. he was a little bit uh, wary of giving the Assemblée Nationale that power. Yep. But didn't he know that the situation was degenerating? I think. The problem with kings is that they're kind of cut off a oh little yeah. bit. I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Who was uh, Bailly again? Bailly, he was a president at this point of the National Assembly. Okay. He also he serves other functions later on. Um, but yeah, I mean, the king, at one point, the day later, tells him, you know, because he, he asked the king, well, the only way for you to maintain stability is you have to take the, tr you have to command the troops to leave. So at this point, the, the king's paranoia over the previous month had induced him to call in 100,000 foreign troops from the Swiss, Austria, and other, other lands to come in to his own nation just in case. He's freaked out. You know. he, he does know that people are ready to kill him. <laughs> um, and so this is freaking out the population, though, too. Keep in mind, you know, you're, you're walking around and you're seeing like all of a sudden these massive you know, platoons of troops, 100,000 strong, come in with massive artillery setting up barricades in every community of France, you know, puts you on edge as an armed Frenchman, because most of the population at this point, kind of like today in America again, you have to throw that out there, is also armed, well, and well, a big part. <laughs> Not to say that it's a bad thing, it's you're right, but I mean still, it's something to be, to keep in mind that was making the, make the situation in the king's mind uh, more paranoid filled. So anyhow, Bailly tells him, you know, Get rid of these guys. We've got the national. We've got a national guard here. Uh, Lafayette's the man. He's heading that thing up, which is working with the Assemblée. We'll replace it. We'll maintain the order. You just have to work with us. And the king says, "Well, hey, how about instead of me disbanding the the military, foreign troops, how about you disband the, the Assemblée Nationale?" Oh. Huh? <laughs> uh. So that doesn't go very well. That's the twenty third of June. Now, and the revolution takes place in July. Yeah, yeah, we're getting there. That's it. We're it's getting tight. So, th this is this is what uh, sh the poet Schiller describes the littleness, both of the population, when but of the king too, in his descriptions of the French Revolution as being because he saw a great moment had found a very little people. And that was embodied in, in what the king had been induced to become as well. S 
So what comes next? You jump the boat, but storm of the best deal. Now, this is totally manipulated. It's crazy. This is just a joke. Um, this is this is what the French population celebrate today. They've got a whole holiday for you. Get the day off work paid. Um, this was this was a definitive moment of stupidity. Where what do you have? I mean, the fear on the, on on all parts created an environment where. Well, okay, you, you gotta understand certain other key players because allied with Necker and Philippe Galité, you had an important commander of, this, of the Swiss army who, had, who was in command of 30,000 troops in, uh, I think it was Versailles at this point. His name was um, Baron Bessenvel de Bronstadt. All right. Baron de Bronstadt <coughs> Was the troop was the commander who commanded his troops to fire on the civilian population in the beginning of May, the previous month, right in that same area. This storming of the Bastille was the product of the enraged population from that act of effectively terrorizing your own population. Now, Bessonville, the week prior to this event, had also commanded. There's there's two letters where he commands the, the governor of the Bastille and another leader within the Bastille, which was the, sort of a prison. That didn't even hold that many prisoners at this point. It was kind of an unimportant fortress. Mm. But he commanded them to kill under all circumstances. He was going to supply them all the food, the, the weapons, the men. He actually promised them 10,000 men, which he never planned on delivering through secret passageways under the Bastille, as long as they just did everything possible to, to you know, Keep the population dead from coming before they would allow, be allowed in. How did he know that? And he also had garrisons and, and uh, gun gunnery areas built in to the whole uh, roof that didn't exist before the week before. Right. Pointed to the area where the people were coming. Whatever. So the first letter reads, I am sending you, my dear Dupuget, who is the, di the director of the Bastille, the order that you know is necessary. You will carry it. The second letter reads to Monsieur de Launay, who is the governor of the Bastille. Monsieur de Launay will hold to the very last extremity. I have sent him sufficient resource, forces. So he's commanding these guys to hold it, hold it down. Oh, shit. <clears throat> so of course, at a certain point, ah, at a certain point, the population, who's all, I mean, they're induced by uh, just a general bloodlust at this point and hate for authority and they're, they're sort of called they're, they're, they're herded towards uh, taking over this this um, post they go in they finally drop the, the they get through the, the barricades uh, the first guards let their guard down I guess <laughs> forgive the pun and their heads are immediately chopped off uh, they go in kill everybody else uh, heads roll and that's pretty much uh, the result of that. The, the, the following days, the population in such a, a frenzy is shouting. Has been, you have records all over where they're shouting, Long live Necker, long live Duc of Orleans. Right? All, why the hell are they shouting these two assholes' names? Why, you know? You know that the, the main propaganda machine at that point was coming out of Orleans Estate, where you had people who some of you may have known already under the names of uh, uh, Marat. Robespierre. Robespierre not, wasn't in the game yet. Uh, da, Dalton? Da, Dalton? Who were, Marat especially, was, were, were main propagandists uh, for the Jacobin faction and, and working with uh, Robespierre just to focus people's anger against all things power, all things government, all things centralized, as an attack on the constitutional, or people like, like Bailly. They were agents of Dupé, or the, the Louvre? Yep. Yeah, they were all based out of his estate. He owned like, you know, 13 square blocks or so, where you had the, the core of all of the, you know, the prostitution, the, the gambling houses, the bars, like the if, if you judged a man by the company he keeps, this guy's a slime ball. You know? <laughs> That's where all the propaganda was coming from. 
So, you know, we know that. Uh, Montjoie has an interesting... Actually, I won't get into that yet. Because the next thing is that while the population was sh shouting for Egalité and Nekel to take over, Nekel was supposed to be the prime minister of this uh, British-style system when the government, when uh, Philippe Egalité would become the king, Egalité was nowhere to be found. Right. This is another paradox that arises. Because at this point, Egalité knew that he couldn't just take over whether the population were asking or not. He still had the, the Dauphin, the king, the queen, you know. So first he had to set up an environment where he had an alibi to be out of the nation while the king was killed. Bah, bah, bah. It gets interesting. So he asked the king uh, for a leave to England because things are getting kind of shaky and the king's like, all right, sure, go for it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> now, <coughs> the... Sorry. Sorry. Now, at this point, uh, Bo Thierry Baudry uh, has done quite a bit of work in this, uh, and there's a lot of first-hand accounts to describe it as well, but you had, on the 12th of July, before the Bastille... Yeah, right before the Bastille. Mm. Oh no, this is the 17th of July. Sorry. Yeah, this is the 17th of, Ju of July. Or the day before. While the king was driving his carriage, um, at some point it stopped before a bridge by, uh, by some water. Uh, a song was sung, I forget what. And a woman in the, in the audience around the king caught the bullet. She blew back died four minutes later in the arms of two of the, the king's entourage. The doctors, the physicians who examined her body, discovered that the bullet, which is high caliber, came from above and across the little river which is beside uh, the king's chariot. And they pursued an investigation, and at that point, Egalité was the man who would, who would receive the blame. Like People pretty much at that point generally knew Egalité was the guy that organized the assassination attempt. But it was determined at that point, because things were so on edge, that they should just cover it up and send him out. So they just said, all right, just take a vacation for a while and come back. The thing was, was hushed over. Um, and there was a quote by Montjoie on this uh, very thing, which is just totally explosive. No, this wasn't Montjoie. This is Antonio Capella, Capello who was the Venetian ambassador writing back to uh, forget a, a director in, in, uh, in England, I believe, actually. The Duke of Dorset, that's it. So uh, I don't know who has some air left in them. If you want to, can you read that from there? Or? Yeah, you can. You want to try it? We have discovered during the investigation surrounding the last troubles that I mentioned to you a conspiracy organized by the Duke of Orleans, which shows that his promotion of the causes of the Prince of the People was made only with the purpose of furthering his own evil designs. I will give you more exhaustive report about the situation about the conspiracy. Sorry, conspiracy of this perilous prince. Perfidious. Oh, perfidious prince. I thought I could read better than I could. <laughs> as soon as I am able to do it with full no knowledge of the situation. For the time being, it seems to me that when he came cognizant. cognizant of a plan projected by the, whoops, by the queen. projected by the queen and according to which the king was to leave Versailles, to be transferred to Metz before he is forced to live in Paris. His first blood prince prepared an assassination of the king and his royal family during the trip, and later in the middle of a revolt being prepared to blow up in Paris. He would get himself nominated lieutenant general of the kingdom. We have discovered an arsenal of munitions of dual ball cartridges, 
and we had discovered that an arms manufacturer had already been contracted to produce, just by himself, 14,000 rifles. The commanding officer, Marquis de Lafayette, was to become the first victim. All necessary precautions have been taken. The national militia and the regulator, regular troops are activated without interruption, and no one was permitted to leave Paris until the day before yesterday. However, since it would have been dangerous in the middle of such a turbulent event to inflict upon the Duke of Orleans the punishment that he deserved, Notwithstanding the fact that being a member of the National Assembly, his person was considered inviolable and sacred. The decision was made to send him away. To cover this up, a special commission was devised as a pretext, and the king sent him on a mission to the King of Britain. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, all right, explosive. Um, this could have all gone to hell now. Um, <coughs> at this point, you could have had a Jacobin king. Uh, people could have gone crazy. They were. But instead, that didn't occur. Oop. Because at this point, the organizing of <coughs> Bailly, uh, de Lafayette, and... I mean, now we're talking about the leading Republican minds and geniuses, scientists, poets, artists, <coughs> in all of France were together in this conspiracy of Bailly's. It's okay. Scientists, poets, and? Scientists like Lavoisier, the, the great chemist, uh, poets, statesmen, just in general, I don't know. You had uh, the greatest minds, basically, in art and science <coughs> were, were in on this together. And that's interesting to, to, to note, too. Um, and so what do they do? They, at this point, Bailly and Lafayette became the leaders of Paris, unexpectedly. We're talking about the 25th of July now. So when everything is going to hell, these guys managed to pull out a huge coup for the good the way this happened was the people in, in Paris were dying to know what was going on. They wanted news. Bailly had successfully arranged for the king to give consent to the legitimacy of the French assembly at this point. So he goes to the, to the people of Paris uh, as a representative of the assemblée, Marquis de Lafayette in arm, and he tells them, now <coughs> the king... On the July 17th, he says, The king had been deceived, but it is no longer the case. He knows our calamities, and he knows them so well that they will never happen again. The people cheered and demanded that he be elected mayor of Paris. Yeah. And they appointed, uh, they appointed de, Marque, uh, de Lafayette head of the um, Paris militia as well. So you had immediately one of the ambassadors from Benjamin Franklin write back to him, John Bonfield, said, Your friend, Mr. Bailly, is chief magistrate in Paris, the Marquis de Lafayette, general and commander of chief. I am satisfied that you will be elated at the liberal sentiments that appear to reign. You will see in our archbishop's report that they are not innocent of the proceedings of America, which they quote as models. Okay. So, <clears throat> Lafayette now sees his duties as being twofold. One is to protect the king from the general mob and to protect the assemblée from intrigues in the royal court. So it's a certain delicate eggshell situation that he's finding himself in, and he works overtime over the next months to maintain that. Now, the issues are twofold. Bankruptcy, the whole nation is bankrupt, right? You had to deal with that. If you get an economic collapse, you're fucked. The population is starving, you gotta deal with that. So that becomes the main focus of Bailly and his collaborators. 
the way that they deal with it is very ingenious because this actually touches in directly upon what LaRouche is proposing now with the HBPA. Because he makes sure that the Assemblée Nationale has the sole authority to issue public credit, issue taxes, standardize weights and measures, um, specifically take the debt, because you want to convert this massive debt that the nation's incurred and convert it to something useful, which is, this is exactly what Hamilton did in, in America, that time where all of the states in America, after fighting, investing in all this money in, this, in the American Revolution, all of the states were bankrupt. And the only way to resolve that was to create a national bank that could say, okay, we're going to federalize, we're going to nationalize the debt, but using the new mandate of the, federal, of the national bank, you would now begin public works projects to issue good credit that would create real employment, but that would also have a benefit upon the productivity, the, um, the general quality of life of the, of the nation by providing sanitation systems and canals and other great things, right? So that wasn't just an American idea. It was specifically, I mean, we can go into this later. This is a Leibnizian idea. Because the root here, in terms of, if you're following the ideas of what's occurring here, where Benjamin Franklin, Hamilton were furthering and implementing the ideas of Gottfried Leibniz, the founder of physical economics, uh, one of the greatest defenders of the rights of man that had died already two generations prior, a follower of Kepler. While they were doing that, instituting the system of government, the pursuit of happiness, which is defined by, this is a Leibnizian idea, it's not John Locke, this is a fraud, but this, they were instituting that, the physical economics of Hamilton was Leibnizian, Similar followers here, uh, around Bailly, were all strictly putting forth the same concepts. It's Leibniz. And the projects that he puts forth are constructions of canals connecting Paris to the Marne River and to the, to the Atlantic near this place known as Dieppe, Dieppe, which was eventually begun in 1799. Uh, building of massive bridges, ex expanding streets, building tons of sewer systems. Uh, <laughs> The good one that, that Bailly came up with was demolishing the uh, Bastille. <laughs> so that would create employment, but it would also get people to put their destructive energy to someplace kind of useful. Okay. So this was totally attacked by the Jacobins. <clears throat> Marat, I mean, these guys were writing leaflet after leaflet. You know, L'Ami de la Peuple was the journal of, of Marat. Uh, attacking these guys as being corrupt, not actually saying anything, kind of like the way Barney Frank responded to, to Rachel's intervention. Uh, nothing is said, but they allude to gossip. And after re repetition so long, you actually start getting whispers, not just in the population, but in the own assemblée. People who have soft minds start falling for gossip pretty easily. You want to ask a question? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, when they, uh, when they model themselves after the National Bank in the United States, yeah. They set up a bank, they issue credit for those projects. Yeah. The productive output of those projects mm -hmm. would in turn backs up the money that they print at the bank. And that way they're able to pay the national debt. Yeah. Okay. You want a conception of the future uh, state of your economy after you build such a thing? Okay. So they start getting, basically they start getting uh, economic projects to kind of like uh, turn the economy over. Yeah, right. And you have to move from a monetarist system, which is what they had under the finance minister and under the, I mean, any free trade system is inherently, it's monetarist, it's money-based. So you're measuring the wealth of your society on a monetary dollar value. Whereas what the Hamiltonian national banking system, what Bailly was moving towards, was a credit-based system, right? And that's based upon where you're, what you're building. And the credit is, or what is monetized is a reflection of the increase of something useful being produced to your society. So it's not just a bank lending you for profit. It's like a bank there just to provide you with the credit that you need to get a business going yeah. and do the project. Yeah. Right. So that's the key for LaRouche's physical economics for anybody taking notes here. <laughs> Got to keep in mind. This is how it works. Hey, uh, what? <laughs> Don't pass out. <laughs> that's, the <le> <laughs> that's the other lesson. Um, all right. The next few months produce some of the most advanced uh, revolutions in 
legislation in France. Like, the two, oh, these are the, putting a face to some of these names. Anybody hasn't seen Danton, Marat, and Robespierre? These are the, I mean, notice there, <laughs> the consistent deaths. <laughs> There's gonna be a reason for that. <laughs> Opening this place seems to, to last that much longer. <laughs> so these are the these are the sources of a lot of the of, of all the intrigues, um, but regardless, even still, they're able to f fight for fight and and institute the two groundbreaking pieces of legislation, which is on August August eleventh, seventeen eighty nine, you had the ab abolishment of the feudal system in France, landed aristocracy and the whole privileges of a, an elite class gone one day. August 26th, you had the Declaration of Rights of Man. A constitution, Article 1, National Assembly completely destroys the feudal regime. It's a good way to start a, start a bill. And jean Sylvain Bailly writes on the great occasion, never... Oh, JP, want to read this? Uh, jean Sylvain Bailly. National Assembly Yep. Never have so many individuals sacrificed so much and demonstrated so much generosity by voting in one by voting in one concerted action and all at once. It is the night of destruction of privileges and of public happiness. The feudal system that weighed on the people for centuries has been destroyed in one blow and in an instant. National Assembly had accomplished more for the people in those few hours than the most wise and enlightened nation have done ruling many centuries. Mm -hmm. And I just exerted the preamble. The Declaration of the Rights of Man in some ways uh, has some compromising qualities to it in the sense that it it's not as strong as the American uh, Declaration of Independence, but the spirit in many cases flows in the same way, especially the preamble, which, uh, JP, you want to yeah. keep going for this? The representatives of the French people formed into a national assembly, considering ignorance, forgetfulness, or contempt of the rights of men to be the only causes of public misfortune and the corruption of government, have resolved to set forth in a solemn declaration natural, unalienable, and secret rights of man to the end that this declaration constantly present to all members of the body politic and remind them unceasingly of their rights and their duties to the end that the acts of the legislative power and those of the executive power since they may be continually compared with the aim of every political institution may thereby be the more respectful to the end that the demands of the citizens founded henceforth on simple and uncontestable principles may always be directed toward the maintenance of the Constitution and the happiness of all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just had a question. Where was Napoleon at this time? Ah, we'll get there. Um, so things at this point are looking good. And then shit hits the fan abruptly. Um, we have now I'm to give you guys a fuller sense, I'm not going to go through this, but I set up a bit of a timeline uh, to go through just how things um, completely just screwed up very, very abrupt, uh, very uh, badly. And the, the following four or five years are, uh, they're backwards. <laughs> well, actually first, here, let's just read this quickly too, because this is um, an embodiment, yeah, this is an embodiment of the principled concepts, I think the clearest form that they'd manifest in, the, in France at this point which was from what's called the Society of 1789, founded ironically in 1790, 
Bye Bye Yi. And the main flank was uh, science, art, and the institution of Leibnizian academies across France. So this is, a, this is really, it's not a political or economic battle, it's, it's primarily it's a cultural battle. You gotta elevate the culture if you're gonna have a population that doesn't go Jacobin. But the, the mandate here I think uh, is sound. And so we'll read this first before we go through the, the crazy shit to have something to compare it to. Um, I'll read it. There exists for individuals an art of assuring and maintaining their happiness. Up until now, it has been developed in moral philosophy and elevated by the ancients to some sort of perfection. There must also exist, for nations, an art of extending and maintaining their felicity. This is what we have called the social art. This science, toward which all others strive, does not seem to have been examined in its totality. The art of cultivating the art of commerce, the art of government, even the art of reasoning are merely portions of that science. They have all developed themselves each on its own, separately. But no doubt, these isolated members will succeed in their complete development only when they are brought together and form a well-organized body. Reuniting so many inconsistent and separate parts, searching into the economic sciences their mutual relationships, and most of all, the common relationship that they can have with the general science of civilization, such as the object of the social art. It is not one, nor many human beings, neither a single nation. It is the concert of peoples which can assure that this art will undergo efficient progress. But this progress will accelerate as soon as the minds shall follow everywhere an orderly task that is constant and uniform. This general common, or this common method must therefore be created, but before it can be established, perfected, and generally accepted, it were natural that its foundations be laid by an association which, by communicating the principles and the spirit which animates it with other similar societies, could, like them, assemble among similar systems the different results of all enlightened men, wherever they may be, and take care of the good of human humanity. This is the plan upon which the Society of 1789 has been founded. Sounds like a real threat to the old one. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like they were on the cusp of what the Americans accomplished in Eighty-seven. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, figure if you want to get the opposing polarity, where the oligarchy gains its power by dividing its idea of one of oneness, mm -hmm. is it the divided sort? Mm -hmm. This is actually looking at all of these different aspects of society, of reasoning, and these different sciences, where the social art, which hadn't yet formed, is of figuring out how they're one, how they're common. Which you could sort of say, I mean, th this, is, this is the root of physical economics, which as a science uh, still is not yet accepted by the general mass of society today. We're I, would say, you know? hmm? I would say that that's the real statesman that could bring all those segments of the population together and work in a, mm -hmm. in a concerted way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those are real principles. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a, like co a battle of conflicting principles, and the oligarchs always do the same thing to control governments and countries. Just yeah, well, check out the, what they're going to do now to get to get a sense of the good and how the good is responded to. Because keep in mind, the oligarchy doesn't come up with creative acts. The oligarchy, what it does, is responds to the good in a, in a, in a way that sees the good as a threat, and that it adapts itself in such a way that it crushes the good. So it itself is not creative. It doesn't change on its own, right? It's like evil is a force unto itself, like many people think. Evil tends to manifest as only as a negation of the good. So it's reactionary. You mean it's reactionary. It's never, it never innovates, never invents, never. No, 
not actionary. Reaction. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is going to get crazy. I'm going to breeze through it, okay? If anybody wants to stop me, don't. <clears throat> October 1789. You've got a women's march in response to the National Guard's declaration of loyalty to the king and queen. The king goes with the women from Versailles to Paris and is held at Paris of, at the Palace of the Tuileries. This was under the advice of uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, who said if you don't go with the women who are leading this, this march, they're going to kill you again. So go with them. Cooperate. People will be happier. Yeah, right. So spring, spring 1790, there's a conflict between the Republicans and the Jacobin extremists. Summer of 1790, the mutinies... All over, uh, are, are all over the place because in the armies, what, occur, what occurred is that to become an, to still be an officer in the army, you have to be of a certain family, right? So the privileges were not destroyed in the armies, and that causes mutinies, where the Marquis de Bouilly, who was one of the collaborators of uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, was forced to put some of these mutinies down and uh, ended up killing 24 mutineers. And Lafayette, who doesn't attack him, he approves of it, because he had to maintain order in some measure, uh, is, start, is labeled in the eyes of the population the enemy. Now, a point in here, interesting to note, the, the, there's a point in the Marseillaise, the, the French national anthem, mm -hmm. which is a total bloody anthem if anybody's listened to it. It's like, we're, we're going to make our fields run with the blood of unpurified... <laughs> you know, it's really, for national anthem, it's intense. Uh, so part of that comes from uh, uh, the Marquis de Bouy, who is the tyrant in the national anthem. Um, Pope Pius, in 1791, Pope Pius the sixth issues a bull for all clergy to denounce and oppose the edict which stops the feudalism. Right? So he said, there's that edict that, you guys remember that one? So this creates a schism inside the church. Uh, June 1791, the king and queen tried to escape from France across the Rhineland at Varennes. And they were about 20 minutes away from um, uh, Marquis de Bouy, who at this point with his new army was waiting for him outside of France at the, at the border. And he was recognized and stopped by the townsfolk at Varennes and was returned back to the uh, Tuileries, the palace of the Tuileries. July 1791, Lafayette orders troops to fire on the bloodthirsty mobs who were demonstrating against the monarchy at Champ de Mars. This doesn't go well. Extremists are now at this point divided into two groups. You've got on the one hand, les Girondins, and the other hand, you've got the Jacobins. Now, the Girondins get their name because, oh, well, whatever. Um, I heard it was from the church that they used to associate with. Close. It's from an, an area. There's a the ville de Girondin in uh, French in oh. France, okay. in the west. Right, right. Uh, the the Jacobins they 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 hung out at the Jacobin Club. So, oh, really okay. um, so June 1792 to July 1792, you have the Duke of Brunswick, who's the leader of the Prussian army. He issues a statement to the people, threatening them not to hurt the king or queen, or else. That's a bad thing to do to an enraged population. Uh, so the revolutionary mob on August 10th, 1792, mob, uh, they storm the Tuileries, they imprison the king and make uh, sort of a, a bastardized republic. Uh, August 15th, 1792, Lafayette condemns the revolutionaries and declares his support for the monarchy. He's declared a traitor, and before he's killed, he runs away to Austria, where he's imprisoned for five years as a revolutionary. Because all of the kings at this point across Europe, they're pretty paranoid, you know. And you've got everyone sort of seeing that, you know, you've got rev You've got Masonic lodges running the revolutions in France and that they want to do it in your kingdom too. So the kings at this point are, uh, yeah, they're just freaked out. <laughs> what, what, what huh? Masonic lodges do? Yeah, you've got, I mean, the Masonic lodges are all over the place and they're playing a huge role. Like Philippe de Galité is the Grand Master of the Orient Lodge in France. He's a manager. Yeah, almost a coincidence, huh? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. So, you know, all of the kings now, like uh, Catherine the Great, bans them all. Uh, the king of Austria bans them. So you got a huge crackdown. Because even inside, not all two lodges are, no, no two lodges are the same. And in some cases, you have uh, the revolutionaries using them, like Marquis de Lafayette, George Washington, 
were actually in there. They had, there were, these laws were the best way to maintain cover and create a conspiracy. And that was going across, I mean, every nation had the good and the bad. Uh, most of the bad was coming from, from, from England. That's where the shit originates in its most vile form. <clears throat> um, so anyhow, go on, moving on. You got January 1793, Danton, uh, he says that, well, the kings of Europe are attacking us. Let us throw, them, throw down to them as a challenge the head of a king. So Louis, right, gets sentenced to death. October 17, uh, 1793, um, Marie Antoinette is guillotined. Um, oh no, January 20th, 17, 1793, Louis XVI is guillotined. Uh, July 13th, 1793, Marat is assassinated by a Girondin woman in a bathtub. She is guillotined. Uh, 1793 summer, uh, the Girondins defeated the Jacobin authority, authorities and guillotined a Jacobin leader. The Jacobins then suppressed the revolt and guillotined dozens of Girardine leaders. Um, at this point, most of the Girardines were all Freemasons at this point. The Jacobins were generally not. They're more like for the, for the people, so to speak. And Freemasons have sort of a, an implicit hierarchy within them in the mystery schools. So uh, that was sort of shunned upon by the, by the Jacobins. Um, then... The Jacobins, when they take over, they abolish all the Masonic lodges, kill tons of, I mean, thousands of Masons, good and bad alike. Mostly, actually good in this case. Um, October 1793, Marie Antoinette is guillotined. Uh, se uh, November 1793, all the leaders, all the, all the leaders are geared, guillotined. Philippe Egalité, who was also, he tried to renounce his, his grand mastery of the Freemason Lodge, but it was a little too late at this point. They're like, no. No, they're, they're sticking to their principles. So, Sorry, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Died in the womb. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh yeah, here we go. Then Robespierre, who was a, the big provocateur of the, of the Jacobins, um, he gains control of the government now in 1794. Uh, Danton and Desmoulins in April 1794 were guillotined for being too moderate. <laughs> 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 Thomas Paine, who was in France at this point, uh, was accused of being a Girondin and was imprisoned and sentenced to the guillotine, but in his case, the guard, when he painted the, this guy's got to be guillotine mark on the door, painted on the wrong side of the door. Oh, no. So that when the door closed, he was safe. Oh, wow. <laughs> but he still spent quite a few years in prison. Uh, wow. Then on July 27, 1794, Robespierre arose in the convention to announce a list of deputies who are traitors to be guillotined. And this is where the strategy becomes sloppy, because he says, after lunch. <laughs> and, uh, of course, right before lunch was over, he was attacked, because everyone's now paranoid, like, fuck, is it my list, am I on the list, am I on the list? It's like McCarthyism, you know? So they, they nailed back, calling him a traitor, uh, and he's guillotined. <laughs> um, and... Right, so this, this leads up to 1795. Uh, the Assemblée is disbanded. Everyone alive <laughs> is like guillotine. Uh, the, and what's called the directory is set up. The directory is the new form of government. Total decadence, luxury. I mean, it's just aristocratic bullshit. But that doesn't go on very long either because at this point, the population is so demoralized. People are fucked in the head. Uh, there's no leadership anymore. They're all guillotined that uh, Napoleon easily comes in, picks up the pieces, and declares himself the, uh, the consul and emperor of France. <clears throat> in what year? That was 1799. 1799? Yeah. Napoleon's yeah. Where, where is he, like, hailed from? Where did he stand from? I don't know. He's France. He's French. Uh, is he a Mason? Is he a British? He's a military. Uh, he's a general. He's a general, right. Um, he's financed by the British, uh, like the, you know, you have the British, uh, he's France, he's French. Uh, is he a Mason? Is he uh, no. British? He's a military, uh, he's a general. He's a general, right. Um, he's financed by the British, uh, like the, you know, you have the British, uh, he's France, he's French. Uh, is he a Mason? Is he uh, no. British? He's a military, uh, he's a general. He's a general, right. Um, he's financed by the British, uh, like the, you know, you have the British, uh, he's France, he's French. Uh, is he a Mason? Is he uh, no. British? He's a military, uh, he's a general. 
Yeah, he's a general, right? He's, um, are you general? he's financed by the British. Uh, like the you know you have the British. I don't know. He's France. He's French. Uh, is he a Mason? Is he uh, no. British he's Mason? a military. Uh, he's a general. He's a general, right? Um, he's financed by the British. Uh, like the, you know, you have the British banks. Uh, primarily, they finance both sides of the war. That that's where the yeah. the, the uh, Rothschilds made most. Their, they they multiplied their fortune by like a multiple of twenty or something at that point because yeah. they finance both sides. And he bragged about it all the time. This guy Amschel Rothschild. Mm. Um, he hedged his bet. Yeah, yeah, he had, yeah. Seriously. <laughs> But no, he wasn't. A, he wasn't a Mason. He was. He had, but he did reinstate the Masons, uh, and he was controlled by Masons, <laughs> like. Uh, um, hmm? He's a French general. Yeah, he, he was a Masa- he, had, he had a Messiah complex, and he was a beast man. He was like a Dick Cheney of its day. Joseph de Maistre. That's the name I was thinking of. Yeah, from the from the Martinist Freemasons. Yeah, and de Maistre. Uh, uh, no, it th- that could be a discussion after the class. Okay. Um, but anyhow, uh, yeah, he had his controllers who were Masons and who also wrote about how they were going to control him. And the idea of taking a psych profile of somebody who is a Napoleon character and modeling it to be your fascist that you control from the background. Was the same model used to apply to to create Mussolini, Franco, Hitler, uh, Barack Obama, Dick Cheney? Same, same model. No, no different quality. Yeah. I remember hearing that a lot of the first, like a lot of the, the people to die were like uh, what you were talking about before, the scientists, the leading members of society, the artisans, the mm-hmm. poets, and things like that. Mm-hmm. My question is, how many, how much of the regular people? I don't have any stats, but I think, uh, by and large, it was anybody who qualified as being, um, as having authority. <laughs> anybody who snip, who smells like, because the, the idea is there's the leadership, there's the government, and then there's you as a proletariat. So anybody who seems like they might be of, within an aristocracy, or within a privileged class, or within whatever, a leader, like, like, like Rob Spear. I mean, this guy was, he wasn't a hypocrite. He would kill everybody because he's an anarchist. You know, he's following his principles, anarchy. <laughs> and I guess he couldn't complain when he got his head chopped off. <laughs> but that was the case. It was the leadership is the, I mean, if you think back to the, um, to the beginning of the class, if you, if you don't have those, uh, those minds who have the identity of leader uh, within them, in these times of mass, these mass phenomena which occur, um, you you have only chaos that occurs, and fascism is necessary, or will is is inevitable, I guess. So the people, what better way than have the people arbitrarily do it to themselves, like kill their own leadership, which is their own salvation, than, uh, well, than do something rational. Which you could imagine. I mean, when people when you're organizing with us, and you know people are telling you, oh, LaRouche, he's a fascist, you know, never read a thing by LaRouche, but, you know, here they are willing to just shun, you're their best friend. (laughs) Best thing you do for them is kick their ass a little bit because they're not thinking. And, you know, but that's the case here. Napoleon was inspired by Jacobins and factions. No, no, he just came in. Well, he cleaned up. He was utilized. Same way Mussolini's black shirts came in and cleaned up after Italy. Dick Power, same thing. This this leads up to uh, to Percy Shelley. So this 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 is really what it's all about. And Larouche points again and again in his papers that the only way you can understand anything from physical economics to science to history to anything to your own identity is through the mind of Percy Shelley, especially in the in defense of poetry, which he relates. Uh, to Bernard Riemann's habilitation dissertation as sort of the the sister like they, they go hand in hand it's not art and science these are this is the most scientific example of poet, poet poetry and I need a volunteer to read the very last quote here Luke Trudeau All right. we live among such philosophers and poets as surpass beyond comparison 
any who have appeared since the last national struggle for civil and religious liberty. The most unfailing herald, companion, and follower of the awakening of a great people to work a beneficial change in opinion or institution is poetry. At such periods, there is an accumulation of the power of communicating, uh, of communicating and receiving profound and impassioned conceptions respecting man and nature. The persons in whom this power resides may often, as far as regards many portions of their nature, have little apparent correspondence with that spirit of good of which they are the ministers. But even whilst they deny and abjure, they are yet compelled to serve the power which is seated upon the throne of their own souls. It is impossible to read the compositions of the most celebrated writers of the present day without being startled with the electric light which burns within their words. They measure the circumference and sound of depth of human nature with a comprehensive and all-penetrating spirit, and they are themselves perhaps the most sincerely astonished at its manifestation. For it is less their spirit than the spirit of the age. Mm -hmm. So Shelley's writing this in a positive light because he's living and watching the American revolutions <laughs> and seeing that people are doing the good and not all of them are cognizant of the good that they're actually performing. But in the same regard, this is like the early 1800s. Yeah. But yeah, right. I mean, in the same regards, this could also be for the bad, too, where people act. But you've got a phenomenon in, in society that, again, has to be taken advantage of. And it, it doesn't come every day. So that's the class. Questions? <laughs> Mm -hmm. When he says it's less their spirit than the spirit of the age, is he saying that like events are kind of events that are happening are kind of inspiring them to do what they do? Yeah, I, I think I had trouble battling that one out, but I think what this is is you have an age which is being like a you have a certain wave being defined by certain ideas being applied a cultural way well you got I mean a Benjamin Franklin you've got a, a small group a core who set forth a dynamic and it's like you can't you can't necessarily explain why it is that you're inspired to like a lot of the people who are uh, fighting the take, take for example um, on the time of even Martin Luther King a lot of the music which started off in that period through the Council on, uh, Congress for Cultural Freedom, it was generally created and crafted to be degenerate music anyhow to, to really just numb people's minds in the 60s. But the effect of Martin Luther King's life and his battle with the, po with the population as a moral leader had the effect where even the debauched music took on the characteristics of having, uh, of carrying forth high ideals. The quality of the music still might have been pretty debauched, mm -hmm. but I mean, certain revolutionary music couldn't deny the fact that there were uh, higher principles seeping through there, so that people were, I mean, it wasn't necessarily of their own volition, you couldn't say necessarily, but yet it, it was. So, so but there's that higher age that was being 
sort of created. And I mean, J it was how JFK of Robert F. Kennedy too. So there was a certain era of era of optimism, which if they weren't there, you can't say would have necessarily have been there, even if you didn't know their names. No. I think it's also the fact that if you're thinking about revolution, you might try to find people that were bred into like some type of revolutionary culture since they were four years old, right? Mm. You know, you need to listen to Mozart when you were like two, <laughs> and then there's this whole curriculum of the so-called revolution, revolutionary. Well, actually, that's not, I, the revolutions don't work that way. You don't necessarily need, as I say, it's less your, your spirit than the spirit of the age. So even if you might be yourself screwed up in culture like North most youth uh, and or the United States, despite that, the spirit of the age is such that leadership will come from those people even though they're not, they're far from the perfect image that we have of, uh, of a Luther King or Gandhi, you know, the other supposedly like bulletproof revolutionary. That's what, that, mm -hmm. I think that's in a sense that's what we see in the U.S. There's this Jacobin thing, mm -hmm. but with our intervention, it's, it's you become able to guide backward people towards a position of leadership, which they would not even have considered a year or so or a few months ago. And they do things that is not from their culture, but it's from the, I guess, the spirit of the age. Is what yeah. we're going to right. I think being self-conscious about it too, because if if you're in a situation like we are, where the age doesn't necessarily supply you a spirit of good, there's nothing really within our age that will do that. <laughs> the only way out of that catch-22 is to go to the higher points of a, of a previous age and take the best of that, of the Renaissance and whatever greatest ideas that are possible. And to do that, you can't do that by accident. It doesn't happen like, oh, I just stumbled, you know, bounced into a Plato book or something, you know. So you, I think the, the, the qualifications for leadership generally, I mean, I think you have to be sort of self-conscious about these things. And then as you influence others, like Rachel Douglas is doing uh, at these town hall events and others, there's, maybe they might be a little less self-conscious of it because they've not, you know, gone to past ages to develop themselves, but they're inspired by, by you guys, you know, by us. And you want as many people to be, to be, uh, to know why they're behaving in a certain way, what's to be fully conscious of these things. Do you think higher ideals can permeate such cultural offshoots as you know, as like expressed in our uh, everyday musical culture or just in culture, but in a way that just kind of spins them around to to become um, more elevated? Well, I think like a good revolution, you have to break certain axioms that are false. So there are certain things which don't exist, but that we, only human beings can live, we can make mistakes like a, a, a rabbit, you know, just it's just being a rabbit, no matter what it does, a lion eats a rabbit, it's not being a bad lion, it's just being a lion. Or an orbit, plants going around in an orbit, and it's just being a planet. Whereas when you introduce the will, we can do things for an illusion, because our imagination is just whether have wrong ideas, wrong reasons to thinking or whatever, and act accordingly. So we, we can make mistakes. And so I think what you what we have here are is the necessity to look at the universe as it is or harmony, for example, as it is, investigate that to the greatest that we can know it till now. So that we already have an idea of what already is implicit in the universe before there was even an Earth. And then with that knowledge, take again a look at the question of what our own music will qualify as our music and our culture as being uh, you know, enjoyed or liked or good or bad. So I think that that's the key thing you want to do first is to look at how did Kepler discover um, the harmonies, what is the sound of a pentagon? How is that so important? You know? I think that will enrich your mind to the point that you, you know, we could tackle these other questions. Cause I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think you could necessarily recombine 
that which exists today into something good. Like I don't think you could have re recombined. Well, it's like the um, could you have recombined the elements of the British monarchy before the revolution in America? Just recombine the elements to form the constitutional republic system. You mean the revolution or the music? Um, the music revolution. Well, I think I want to take the best. Well, th that's just that's just something I'm not, I'm asking. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Ongoing. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Good question. Yeah. Why was it that during the seventeen the decade of the seventeen nineties everything just degenerated so quickly? Seventeen nineties. Oh, you mean that thing that I just read really quickly? Yeah. Um. Because, like, why did Bolivia and Lafayette fail, whereas like a guy like Napoleon comes along and picks up the pieces afterwards, quite easily, actually? Well, Bailly writes uh, later on that the while the Assemblée, the formation of it, and the Tenth Cordo were probably the greatest moments in French history, it was only known about by a minority of maybe a handful of leaders who were participants. Uh, whereas something like the storming of the Bastille was seen by everybody, and just more glamour, <laughs> you know. But but that's the thing. I mean, you, you just had a population that wasn't able, through various reasons, to respond to, or to recognize uh, those sal uh, those ideas that were necessary for its salvation. And uh, but they were under serious pressure too after years of famine and all kinds of crazy yeah, things going yeah, on in sure. society. Yeah, right. So it's like, do you think then that they unleashed? Do you think then that ultimately the guy, the Duke of Orleans, his plan actually, even though he died, mm -hmm. his plan to destabilize the country through the, the grain speculation mm -hmm. and other, you know, motive of. Well, was British. He, he was owned by the British Foreign, foreign Office, Jeremy Bentham. Uh, they, they were able to foment that type of chaos through all kinds of different prices. Sure. Generate the population. Yeah, that's not hard to do. It, I mean, creating, you know that people, if they're, people get scared. <laughs> if you can create environments where people are scared, uh, you know that they're going to want to not be scared. So if you can have both those things in your mind, uh, it's like September 11th or the just burning of the hashtag, you know, hashtag. People who did that weren't geniuses. They just knew how to scare people and keep a secret. So. But that, that's, that's what we're looking at here, right? It's, it's the same principle as the as September 11th. It's like if, if you could imagine in the future, this is the craziness of having a Bastille Day. You can imagine the future somebody having a September 11th day and having that as a national holiday. Yeah. Uh, but, no, I mean, it, the, you need, there's certain things that qualify you for leadership. And uh, if you don't have that, Napoleon, I mean, he's just a, a messiah complex egomaniac. You'll be utilized. You'll be a tool. So what's the beast man thing about Napoleon? Oh, that, well, that's, I, you pick up our, our Children of Satan book, then it goes through some of this stuff with Joseph de Maestre. So it's humbling the children. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> probably. Probably. Oh, <laughs> probably important. I, I, that was just off the top of my head. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, I. Uh, generally speaking, uh, from what I from what I have read, um, he's he's under the profile of a, of the executioner. You know, you need like in in order to do the disgusting shit to to burn the hashtag to kill a bunch of I mean to create holocaust you know to create a holocaust, you need somebody who's got no empathy <laughs> and who's full of themselves, and that's generally it. And <coughs> De Maestro just wrote down uh, how that would be, how that would be done. He he intellectualized it and made it a a, a mandate. You know, he just said how to do it. <coughs> but we have a whole pamphlet on, on Children of Satan with Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney and going through this whole Beast Man thing. <coughs> that sounds like one of those things. Schwarzenegger, yeah. Well, it, it's doing something which is Michael so horrible Bloomberg. that will keep people quiet. Yeah. I, the yeah. beast man, like someone you would never confront ever. Because what he does is just horrible. Yeah. Because, oh my God, he's trying to 
provoke this guy in a well dead body. <coughs> that, that's how these beast women were perceived. Mm-hmm. But it's ironic that Obama seems to flip the beast man archetype on its head because he's saying, like, instead of ruling people through fear, he's kind of like ruling you through guilt, like guys like him and Gore by saying, look, this has to be done. You know, mm-hmm. you have to do it or else you're going to have yourself to blame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably not a beast man per se, it's just controlled by beast men. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, that's what the, the, the well, economists are saying to the population, too. They're saying that it's, uh, it's your lifestyle, all of the debt you put, all of the. Uh, so they the flip it. Yeah, yeah. They, they flip it against yeah, you and say, it's you, yeah. buddy. <laughs> You're the problem. Exactly. They're taking their money and blaming the, pop- the American population for it. Mm-hmm. But you look, you look at, at, at Greece, for, for instance, for this, and you see that, I mean, what we're dealing with now with Obama and this intense form of liberal sophistry is exactly the type of thing that Plato was up against uh, to a T with um, Pericles. I mean, it's not that different. The guy just gives everybody anything that they want to say. E- anything they want to hear, he gives them. You know, and the population Soft. is, yeah, the sophism, just again and again, he'll tell you anything, and he'll spin it to make himself sound like a hero, but in the meanwhile, you know, what's happening to Athens in the course of Pericles' uh, reign, and Socrates is there providing you the solution to how to get out of it, you know, every time he's tackling a sophist, it's right there. It degenerated into tyranny, finally, just like, just like what happened in France. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the danger with Obama, is that currently, like, you see what he's done now with the Constitution. Like, you... The Honduran, pre- the Honduran president, a puppet for George Soros, a big drug, like, narco-trafficker, tries to change his own Constitution to allow himself to run multiple times, right? The, the Congress just does its job, <coughs> puts him on a plane in his pajamas and sends him off to Nicaragua. Obama comes to his aid, saying, you know... Constitutions are great and all. That's what Obama says the next day on the camera. You know? Constitutions are great, but sometimes they just stop you from making the really tough decisions. Uh, he right. said that verbatim. Yeah, because he wants to kill people. He knows that his, the effect of his policy is anti-constitutional. You know, so yeah. So you look at he's, he's he knows the consequences. I think he's more self-conscious than we think, but he knows that the general welfare clause does not. Uh, yeah, well, apply to what he wants. Supposedly, LaRouche <laughs> says Obama was there because of the British Empire, too. You know, yeah, George Charles working with the chairman of the Democrats, uh, Howard Dean, I think. Was it sure, Howard yeah, Dean? all these guys. And, and yeah, all these guys worked with the, the British Empire, and, and uh, George Charles was working with this guy, and he directly put Obama. They, they completely knew that they, this, this, this could happen, and mm-hmm. take, they could control uh, Obama. Yeah. So they killed like two or three supporters of uh, Clinton. She backed up, and then uh, Obama got in the game, and uh, mm-hmm. was running the White House, the White House by with, with their own hands. Yeah, well, it was where you need people. How people have an idea of natural how law. How was the Clinton mm-hmm. beaten at the, the Denver convention? I forget, but in general, I'm not too sure. I'm, if you know, I don't know. But uh, at, at one time, Miss Clinton was like uh, the hope of. Uh, I know in in in, uh, in Michigan. Yeah, she down right. Cause she won in Denver, and then um, in Michigan, you you know she won, but then Obama's name wasn't in, so nobody, none of the voters were registered. They were they weren't acknowledged, and so you had a big, it was a big operation though. Um, no, I, I think at the, at the root of this whole discussion though is is just natural law. Like, you've got two conceptions where an an imperial sort of blank slate conception is that you have the the you have the rights, you have that's the the government has given you those rights, and that's why they're there, right? That's why rights exist. Whereas the other, on the other point of view, that of the Founding Fathers, the idea of the soul is, is primary. It's not like you've just had rights impressed upon you as a blank slate, but you already have, because you're a human and you're not a monkey or a cow, you have inalienable rights implicit in your existence and that you have to defend. And so Obama obviously doesn't have a conception of inalienable rights of man, yeah, obviously, just by virtue of what he does and how he thinks. The health care policy. Yeah. And any population that had a moral fitness to survive needs to, needs to underst- would, would identify that immediately. 
that no, there's universal rights, things are sacred, and then there's what you're doing. <laughs> we have, and they organize themselves on that, on that basis. So that's what we have to bring to bear uh, and figure out a way to communicate that as people because they don't know that they have inalienable rights. They really don't. There's the rich and then there's the poor. And that's, you know, money makes the world go around. That's, that's where your rights come from. That's, you know. So. That's what you call the monetarism. Yeah. Yeah, you're owned by the money. The money gives you rights. Africa, well, you know, they shouldn't be so poor. Monetarism. <laughs> Sucks, but, you know. So, like, about what LaRouche talks about and whatever he thinks or whatever he wants to develop, but, like, if we manage to repair the, the ongoing monetary financial breakdown across the United States and around the world mm -hmm. after managing to complete this, uh, like, crisis and, 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 and fix the, the economy, how, how could we, from mm -hmm. that, from that point, uh, manage to develop what LaRouche wanted to develop, uh, the, uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, South America? Would, 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 would like LaRouche work with a different president, or would LaRouche be a president himself? How could we uh, manage to get on with the plans of uh, developing uh, the, the, the world as LaRouche uh, was planning? You gotta be. <laughs> Me? Yeah. Well, you, you, gotta, you gotta see yourself as a statesman yeah. of the highest quality. Which, I mean, most of us don't do on a regular basis. Yeah. But if you have that idea, that identity, that you, you have to fight for, it doesn't come like that. But then you're able to think about policy. Because it doesn't really matter who happens to be occupying a seat of power. But if they're a human being, you know that there's certain policies that are they're just, they're already implicit in the universe <laughs> that are necessary because they're good and they're good because they're necessary, that they will respond to. And they may need to be organized by you to see that. Because okay. they've got certain other assumptions in their mind that prevent them from seeing what you see. So. So you have to be there to accompany whoever's gonna occupy the seat yeah. of power in order to. Yeah, you don't have to hold their hand, but yeah. you, you have to see the power of an idea, right? Like the, it has a certain indirect influence as, uh, as these people who act, but not knowing what that they're the ministers of the good, that's the spirit of the age. Yeah. And if they're yeah. not human beings and they're behaviorists, what then do you do with them? Well, then you put them in a little box or some shit. <laughs> Just a box or something. You might need a couple <laughs> of beefies for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fit them all in, I've heard, I've them all in a little box. <laughs> I've heard about the spirit, the spirit of the age. <laughs> yeah. The spirit of the age, but um, what is it? I've, I've read in a, well, in you a German do word for that. Yeah. 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 Well, what's what's the definition of the spirit of the age? Meaning, meaning the the, the sure, opportunity. Right. Zeitgeist. Uh, oh, it's the zeitgeist. Oh, okay. yeah, it is. And it's talked about the zeitgeist now. It is like uh, Lindsay Lohan, Ben Spears, and Paris. It's like, like, like the zeitgeist of the day, I guess. Maybe I guess <laughs> you could consider it's that. It's Does that come from? <laughs> I don't know. The popular uh, saying or the popular. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's the spirit of the age. Let's think of it, think of it that way. So we should just read that. We should we should set up a uh, a moment to read through Shelley's in defense of poetry. Sure. Eh? Sure. What do you think? Have you ever read Shelley? Uh, Percy Bryce Shelley. That'd be a good idea. We could maybe even do that tomorrow, if you guys want. It's like twenty yeah. pages. So yeah, and well, you just got a well, taste of it. Well, but. Uh, suppose we. Yeah. Right tomorrow. What? The ones. The what? Which of that is the next September? Eighth, eighth of September. That's tomorrow. The next webcast? Yeah, what you should do here, think about this. Uh, tomorrow, because they're, okay, I'm going to give you like a little uh, sketch.